All right, so today's speakers, we have myself. Uh, I'm the Director of Research and Education at Altmetric. Like I said, my name is Stacy Conkeel. And we also have with us Fiona Miller from the University of Sterling. She's a research impact officer there. And Fiona is going to be exploring how researchers at her university are considering the use of altmetric data in communications beyond online and social media and into funding applications, reports, CVs, with the purpose of demonstrating impact. And then we will hear from the University of Sheffield's Kate Armstrong and Sarah Gear. Uh, Kate is the Evidencing Impact Project Lead at Sheffield, and Sarah is the Impact Consultant at University of Sheffield. And Kate and Sarah are going to share some research-backed strategies for impact evidence gathering based on the results of a project they've been working on called the Evidencing Impact Project. And they're going to share how to design workflows for collecting data that can be used to write stronger, more compelling grant applications and reports. Um, so first things first, uh, like I said, I'm going to give a bit of a lay of the land uh, to set the stage for what our guest speakers are going to be talking about today. So for those who don't know, who are new to Altmetric, we are a data science company that track discussions of research online. So in a nutshell, if a journal article or scholarly monograph is shared on Twitter, uh, if it's recommended on a blog, if it's discussed in the mainstream media or maybe cited in a public policy document, we capture that attention at Altmetric. And so we've got this database of over 8 million pieces of research and the related discussions that surround the research. This type of data is called Altmetrics. We are one of several Altmetrics companies. We've just got uh, maybe the best name, <laughs> the most closely associated with the type of data that we collect. Uh, and our data is really comprised of a lot of different things. It's got tweets, links on Reddit, blogs, faculty of a thousand expert peer reviews, uh, scholarly bookmarks on Mendeley, and data from a lot more online spaces, which means that we have a lot of data to play with and analyze, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So over the next few minutes, I want to dig into some of the following questions. So I wanted to understand how often funded research is discussed online in general. Um, and then how does that compare to all research in similar subject areas? I wanted to see where research that's funded is being shared, uh, both in terms of the online spaces where it's being shared and where in the world people are talking about research. And then I wanted to understand also, is attention to research sustained over time? So what I did was I pulled um, funded research in two very broad subject areas from two major UK funders. Um, I found similar research in Scopus published in the same general subject areas. And in both cases, for simplicity's sake, I limited the sample of research to just journal articles and article reviews, and I limited also to research that was published by scholars working in the United Kingdom. And I chose articles from 2014 to look at to ensure that we had a few years worth of attention data to play with. If a paper has been around longer, it's just going to have more altmetrics. Same way it would have more citations in theory. So here is what I found. Uh, the first interesting bit is that surprisingly a much lower proportion of funded articles had online attention than other subject area research in general. The next thing I found was that in terms of where funded research is being discussed online, uh, for funded arts and humanities research, it's shared a lot in Twitter uh, and a lot in the news, which matches what we tend to see for all research in general on our database. Uh, most articles are tend to be shared on Twitter and on the news. That's where a majority of our attention data comes from. Funded biology research, or BBSRC research, uh, also had a lot of attention from those same sources, and it also showed some unique attention sources. Um, some of this research appeared on the Chinese social network Sina Weibo, some on the Q&A site Stack Overflow, and even on LinkedIn. AAHRC, oh, there we go. <laughs> AAHRC uh, funded research from 2014 had sustained interest over time. We see that even a year later, a few years later, there are these peaks in attention that happen on Twitter as interest renews. Uh, but in terms of the biology research, 
relatively speaking, there was less sustained interest over time. But we should note the difference in scale here, right? Um, because for AAHRC research, um, we have uh, a peak of a little under 350 shares at, at the very height of attention for this research. Um, for BBSRC, our peak is in the mid 2000s for shares. So the scale of attention, um, just because we're looking at a larger uh, uh, population of articles, we're going to see much more overall attention for those. In terms of where in the world research is being funded, it's really interesting to note that there's a larger spread of countries discussing the Scopus articles than the funded research set. And that differed from what we saw when we were comparing BBSRC funded research with overall biology and biochemistry research in Scopus. The proportion and the spread of countries was virtually identical. So in terms of what we can learn from this and what we should take forward in terms of this webinar and also in thinking about your own strategies for collecting evidence of impact, there's a few things to keep in mind. Uh, one, is that proportionally funded research is discussed less online than other research, at least for BBRC and, and UK funded research. Uh, so you'll need to have an engagement strategy to make sure that you don't fall into the same trap. Second is that funded arts and humanities research in general, and this isn't just true for the funding sample that I looked at, this is true across the board, uh, there's less attention online for arts and humanities research than for biology studies. Uh, and funded humanities research, in terms of what we saw here today, is also discussed less worldwide than arts and humanities research in general. So that points to a special need for humanities researchers to always have an engagement strategy and to do outreach. And finally, it's really worth pointing out that attention to funded science research we see drops off over time, and this suggests a need for sustained outreach strategies. So you can't just publish an article, do some initial interviews and tweeting, and then hope that people will continue to pay attention over time in the months and years to come. If your research continues to be relevant, you should continue to do outreach on it. So, with all of that said, now let's turn to Fiona from the University of Stirling, who's going to share tips for using altmetrics data as a feedback loop to build outreach and communication strategies. Thanks very much, Stacey. I'll just show my screen. Here we are. Lovely. Hopefully you can all see my slides there. Um, I work in the research and innovation services in the pre-award life cycle aspect of research funding um, and I also deliver our research communications through our Twitter account at stir underscore research and also our um, research and innovation services blog. I first started using altmetric data um, when we were looking at our ways of communicating. So how are we telling um, the outside world of the academic um, publications that our researchers are doing and the impact that they're having and the attention that it's been getting. And it led us to begin to think about how we could use this evidence and information further, particularly in the pre-award life cycle. So when you're communicating your impact that derives from your research, it's a fundamental activity that's not just limited to research communications like on Twitter and such like or even just ref. There's an increasing demand and a need to communicate and evident your research in your grant application for a number of reasons um, that I'll talk about throughout my presentation like track record, feasibility. But how, how does this occur in reality? We're talking about a funding application that you haven't, you haven't done the, the research for yet so how do you talk about impact of it? Um, as I said, the demonstration of impact um, demonstrates your track record, it encourages feasibility of your research with particular consideration of your pathways to impact by demonstrating through evidence what impact you've already had and how it's been reached in the outside world and in wider society, then funders will understand that you are the person that can do this and you have that track record. So over the next or 10 minutes, I'm going to touch on these questions and I'm going to provide a few examples of the evidence the researchers here at Sterling are gathering for inclusion in their research um, applications. So fresh from the ARMA conference that was happening this week, impact champion Julie Bailey defined impact as something that has occurred 
um, as, a as a result of a change in the wider world. So policies changed or treatments changed as a result of your activity being the research. Well, research councils, the RC UK, actually define research impact as a dem demonstrable contribution that excellent research makes to society and the economy. Therefore, when you're evidencing the impact in your application, the first thing is important to think about what definition your funder might be using. So then when you're gathering the evidence for use within that application, you're using the right sort of information that they're going to be looking for um, and expecting. So thinking about impact as equal in change, and by gathering evidence of your impact, you can demonstrate the ripples that your work is having on society and beyond your traditional sort of academic beneficiaries. Changes in terms of impact can be as simple as one individual that attended an exhibition that you ran um, and as a result have changed their perspective, to even having the substantial change on treatment as a result of a scientific discovery that you made in research. So when we're talking about evidencing research for grant applications and for wider research activities, you need to plan what that impact is going to be, you need to plan ahead for it, hence sort of the pathways to impact. And you also need to record your evidence as and when it happens. At Sterling, we like to encourage our researchers to think of uh, gathering evidence as the task of writing your CV. So if you keep it updated as the good things happen throughout your career and you have the milestones, it's far easier than three, down, three years down the line when you're putting in that, that CV for a job and you're trying to remember everything you've achieved. So thinking about the why. In a recent conversation with an early career researcher who was developing a funding proposal, she asked me, how do I demonstrate my career contributions, which is similar to evidencing impact. And after we discussed the usual suspects, inclusion of publications, awards and honours, or any research students you've supervised, I asked my researcher if she'd ever used our subscription for alt metrics for institutions. And I wasn't surprised um, when she told me she hadn't. Um, or the, when she was pleasantly ple pleased with her altmetric score, which she knew nothing of. So we looked through the database and we discussed how she could use her altmetric data, which is a form of evidence, um, to convey the contributions that her research had made. We considered if her publications had been used in policy papers, which news mediums had picked up, who exactly was tweeting about it and what were they saying. Um, and then from there, we also looked at other people's publications and what attention they were attracting. And fortunately, my researcher began to recognise the influence that she could have on that attention just through her, other met her own methods of communication. And she was then starting her journey to gather evidence of impact. So when she then provided me her car career contributions uh, for peer review, it was far stronger um, than our initial conversation had been because she could use this evidence to demonstrate real contributions. Um, she was able to actually see where her impact, her research was being used. So despite being here to stay and with many more impact tools being offered by research management systems, it's always been difficult for researchers to evidence their impact. It goes back to that conversation about her career contributions. Perhaps we're just terribly British to be modest. So using viable evidence of impact like the altmetric data and all the other forms of metrics and different types of evidence of impact that we can have, you can alleviate that difficulty as the evidence supports your story. Um, using the evidence in your funding application is no different to the way you would use PhD completion rates in an ERC case studentship or listing previous uh, funding from the project team and de detailing institutional research performance. So you can use the evidence in exactly the same way. But it's not enough just to gather evidence and it's not enough just to say um, I had this paper and um, it was read by, uh, it's got a, a citation mark um, of whatever it has. Um, and it's also important to remember that dissemination itself is a pathway to impact and not impact itself. Therefore, with the evidence that you've gathered, it's really important to provide context um, and make sure that you're using it in the right places. So the evidence allows you to provide a story um, that can be told throughout your funding application. We talked about demonstrating track record of the team, so demonstrating who's reading your articles, who's uh, engaging with your research and what research you've already had, um, and evidencing that impact. Um, you can also use it to identify new academic beneficiaries 
Um, so if you go on to Altmetric, you can see who else has um, got high scores or, or what scores they've got and how it's being used and identifying people you might wish to collaborate. Um, and you can also use it um, to talk about who's picking up on your publication. So we've got the example on screen here, talking about the data behind um, the Altmetric score and giving the context for it there. So using the Altmetric data provides the context behind the numbers and it turns a story into something that you can actually tell within your funding application. And as I mentioned, you can use it in your CV, in interim reports, and potentially even your email signature. And it just takes away from that quantitative nature of the data and the evidence and tells a little bit more behind it. So I have three examples here at Sterling. So we have one where we have an impact on policy. So one of our researchers um, does a lot, attends a lot of parliamentary meetings, provides evidence, and also their research is cited regularly in these parliamentary meetings. So by including the minutes of these meetings, or even just reference to them, where the PI's research and studies are cited, demonstrates the impact that that individual is having on policy and the changes that they're um, incurring through their research, which then again helps with their track record, feasibility, and everything to support the funding of that application. Impact on society. Um, so one of our researchers um, has developed a technology um, that's then been used by public bodies, for example, the police. Um, and by using evidence of when this is being used, it's been in TV programs, um, all the times it's been discussed or used, that researcher can then demonstrate the impact that they've had on society therefore um, meeting the sort of impact agenda that's required of them. And then finally, the impact on academic beneficiaries. So who is looking at your research? So um, in the previous slide, we talked about, it showed you the context behind um, the altmetric number, for example. Um, so using metrics like altmetrics to identify the interdisciplinary fields that your research is reaching. It's not enough just to have a high score. We need to know where it's come from, who, and what's deriving it. So thinking about going forward on your own and thinking about how you're going to start gathering your evidence, which hopefully will start today in your impact evidence journey, think about creating a coherent narrative and explain the relationship behind the research and the impact. Remember to use the evidence as a starting block of the impact story by explaining the background to the evidence. Don't just say, here's the qualitative or the quantitative numbers. Be clear and be specific. Use the evidence to quantify it, provide the meaning, um, and don't allow that evidence to be ambiguous. Don't just open up a can of worms. Um, make sure you're giving the context to make things meaningful. Um, you can do give context by showing how research papers have performed relative to others um, and not just listing out metric scores on their own. Also use the evidence to identify beneficiaries. So through the evidence, um, identifying policymakers who tweeted your study, that's sort of the impact that you've had on these people and what they've been saying about it and using it as an opener. And then you can also use the evidence in your application itself. So using that in the form of quotes um, or even the quantitative, the hard numbers that comes out of the evidence itself. And finally, this goes back to that ambiguity. Don't tell people that you've got bananas when in fact you have salami. Be careful of where your data comes from and how it might be interpreted. Don't oversell the impact or the attention. Make sure you're selling the right aspects of it and don't be misleading. Providing the context in which your, your data sits, example, for the percentiles, how it compares to your discipline, are all ways that you make sure you're telling the, the relevant impact story and relating that context to your funder. Remember the two different definitions for impact. Don't tell the funder everything um, and make sure that the lesser information is provided um, for how you will build impact and how you'll take that forward. So hopefully that's been a quick whistle-stop tour of how we're using uh, evidence of impact in our funding applications. Um, it's the idea that there's pathways to impact that you can use it in, um, case for support, your track record, um, and also thinking ahead for the next research project. I'd be happy for anyone to contact me on the details below, and I believe that Stacey will circulate the slides. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Fiona. Now we are going to turn it over to Sarah and Kate. Hello. I'm just going to start my slideshow one moment. Um, I would like to uh, talk about a couple of things. Firstly, just to add to Fiona's excellent presentation around including evidence in a grant application, but particularly from a forward-looking perspective. So um, yes, you need to include your track record very much, but you also need to include evidencing of your pathways to impact activities going forward to create a virtuous circle. And then I'm just going to quickly give an introduction to a project we've recently done at the university around evidencing impact that um, Kate Armstrong is going to talk about in much more detail. So um, there are two elements of including uh, evidencing in a grant proposal. Firstly, is to show your track record and show why you are the person that can do this, that you understand the impact agenda. But secondly, it's necessary as you write your pathways to impact, it's very good practice to think about how you're going to evidence the activities that you've decided to carry out to help maximize the impact of the research that you're uh, bidding for. Um, there's several reasons for this. As Fiona pointed out, it's much easier to gather impact evidence as you go along than it is to look retrospectively. And I think a lot of us found out this during the last Research Excellence Framework. Um, and the evidence that you gather as part of this grant um, of the success of your impact activities is going to perform the uh, track record elements of your next grant proposal. So you need to be starting to bank that and gather that evidence as you go along. And secondly, um, if you include a thought around how you're going to evidence your impact or evidence the uh, success of your impact activities in your pathways to impact, it does make you look more committed to that pathways to impact. And funders like evidence because they need to have evidence for their own purposes and they want to encourage people to do that. So um, the issue with this, or not an issue exactly, but the um, uh, complication, sorry, I've skipped a slide there, um, is that, um, hang on, there we go. Impact is unpredictable. So although you can say where you think your impact's going to go at the early stage of a project, it can develop in all sorts of ways. And it's hard to know what evidence you're going to need um, for the impacts that are going to eventually develop from your project. So the best thing to do, um, we found, is to uh, think about each uh, impact activity and think about what you're trying to get out of it, how you think it's going to forward impact, and what success would look like. And then you can think of a few things to evidence that. So this is what we encourage academics to do. Um, Outmetrics is obviously a very important tool to help do that in that if you're holding a meeting with a certain group of stakeholders and you keep uh, and you keep the list of who's attended and then Outmetrics can show you which of those attendees, if there's been a boost in sharing in that particular stakeholder group, where it's gone and who has um, used it and then those two combined show how successful that particular activity has been. Um, it's quite important to have conversations with partners early on if you are working closely with a particular stakeholder group or partner about why we need to evidence impact and to find out what um, their own metrics are, if they are measuring the success of their collaboration with you, um, what they're hoping to get out of using your research and see what they would be prepared to share and agree it with them um, in advance so that they are less uh, uncomfortable possibly if you suddenly turn around and say can I have some evidence of this that or the other and this is particularly true of commercial partners we found um, while we were trying to evidence the last ref so we try and do that now in all uh, budding impact stories um, in terms of keeping the evidence as you go along we found it very useful to provide staff with a single repository it's part of our research management system there are a lot of uh, online tools and uh, software available now to store and track impact I'm not going to particularly plug any one um, but just a place where they can put all their evidence upload files uh, keep web links whatever as they go along um, keep those footprints along your impact journey clear um, so that you can then make a case for it later on and have, it, have every step of the journey towards your eventual impact, whatever that might be, uh, clearly evidenced. So that was just really quick. Next, um, we decided here at Sheffield a while ago that we needed to launch uh, a little project to help our staff to evidence impact. And, and the main reason for this is because the second most frequent question I'm asked by researchers is how can I evidence my impact? Obviously, the first question I am asked is what is impact? Um, secondly, how can I evidence it? 
So there are lots of sources of guidance out there. Um, they can be disparate. They're in lots of different places. They can be hard to navigate. And sometimes they're written more with a view to impact professionals than they are to individual academics who are very new to impact. So we wanted to get something that would be a really clear how-to guide that we could share with our staff to help them go about um, finding the impact of what they've done. And we figured that now, um, particularly with the very useful Ref Impact Case Study Database, there was enough evidence out there to really do a meaningful project on this and to pull all the strands together. So we uh, at the University of Sheffield have access or the option to bid for internally funded 100-hour student internships every year. There are a certain number on offer. And we bid for that, and we were successful. And we were lucky enough to get Kate Armstrong on board. So um, I would like to now introduce Kate. Without further ado, Kate. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, so I'm just here to kind of, hang on, let me just get my start up. There we go. Get rid of that. Ooh. <laughs> There we go. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, so um, thank you, Sarah. So as Sarah said before, um, I came in with kind of um, a naive view to really get to grips with how, it, how impact is evidence. And I suppose that my um, naive view was actually an advantage to me because I came at it from the same perspective as um, a researcher might do who has... has um, created this great research project, but they're not quite sure how to evidence the impact of it. And so I went about it um, by looking at essentially all the evidence that's available at the moment for how to evidence the impact. And so that was by looking at guides that were already available, um, searching, as you can see on the screen, um, the REF impact case studies that are available as well. Um, and it was particularly through the use of these, so looking at really, really great examples of when um, impact has been evidenced well and what this looks like and essentially how those researchers went about doing it as well. Um, so just to kind of echo what Sarah said before as well, um, researchers seem to know what, what kind of evidence they need but there isn't, there's no really explicit examples of how to do that, guides of how it really simply and concisely go about that. Um, so that's something that I set out to do. So just to backtrack a little bit, um, I took a look at the impact case studies. Um, I looked at, th these were like a really key resource in understanding what, ev what this evidencing impact looks like in really good case studies. Um, and also it was really, really interesting because there was a wide variety of research domains, obviously all different types of research, wh which was um, really relevant to different kind of evidencing because obviously impact evidencing is really different depending on what kind of research you have. Um, which is, again, something that, that has been flagged by researchers before. And so something that I find that I found really key was um, getting impact evidence in guides which really appeal to everybody and are really clear and straightforward for um, so researchers can understand how they apply to them. Um, and as I said, yeah, these flagged the most widely used um, evidencing strategies across each different research domain. Um, and so before I could create these how-to guides, it was really important to gather all the different kinds of um, impact evidence and strategies. Um, and so these were emails, testimonials, public engagement surveys were a really, really good one. And so following events or, um, yeah, like public engagement um, events, it, was, it seemed really useful to get feedback from, from these members of the public that did attend, whether this be one month later or immediately following the event or a little bit further down the line, so maybe six months on. Um, and, and impact case studies that did this re that did this really really well seem to score really highly in the ref. Um, so Google Analytics, Twitter Analytics, and Outmetrics they were really great uses as well. Um, websites and articles, social media comments on Facebook. Obviously these are um, the, the, these seem to be perceived as a little bit more informal um, and maybe carrying less um, like qualifying weighting. But really they're, they're again they're a really great use of showing how people who are maybe outside the research domain really feel about it and showing that your research is really generating that, um, that interest outside of places that you would typically look for it. Um, media outlets um, in, the, in the UK, really big one is BBC News. Um, government documents, reports, um, for example, like documenting policy changes that might come following some really, good, really great research. 
um, or Hansard, which seem to be quite unknown by the research that I, re researchers that I communicated with. Um, but it's essentially an online documentation of where academic research has been re referenced in the UK Parliament. Um, yeah, so that like that's just a really quick overview of the kind of impact evidence and strategies that I that I saw that were really seem to be really effective in showing how impact has really revolved around the research. Um, yeah, so however, although defining these evidence, evidencing strategies helps give a clear and concise picture of types of evidence, researchers have flagged that they struggled with how to do this, and so they understand that, for example, it's really great to have um, a testimonial, or it's really good to um, see your Facebook comments that people have written, but they find it hard to access these, these mediums and these outlets for where they can do it. And so this is, this is what the majority of my time was spent doing, was formulating um, different ways for researchers to really grasp this. Um, and so after much like, liaison with all the experts in the team that I was working with, um, it, we, we came up with a page for researchers um, at the University of Sheffield to learn more about how to evidence their impact. Um, we provided a range of explicit and simple how-to guides that are available to researchers at our university anytime um, at all points in the impact evidencing journey. Um, and so, for example, as you can see on the screen, there's a little screenshot of one of our pages looks like. Um, and so the key, the key aims for this was to um, show researchers that it's not because the, 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 research, the, um, the research that we did ourselves um, showed that um, there, there was so much information, there were so many guides that it was actually becoming quite difficult and, and a, bit, a bit laborious and a bit of a long task for researchers because there was so much information. It was kind of, oh gosh, like where do we even start? Um, and so this, this, this is purposefully clear, concise and short in each of the guides that are given there. For example, on the places like um, follow-up questionnaires or um, practice and professional body guidelines, in, with, within each of these drop-down boxes, um, there's like a simple how-to guide um, for each of the different places. So for example, Hansard, as I, as I mentioned before, there's, um, uh, there's a how-to guide of how to log on, how to create an account and how to navigate that website itself. Because although it seems like quite a simple um, task, I found myself going onto it that it, it, it is actually it, it was actually quite difficult, and so providing this was actually really easy. And so obviously, um, with grant funding and, and other or other aspects of um, research development, it's really important to evidence impact as as we've established today. And so we found that these guides these guides were a really easy, um, clear way of helping researchers to do that. Um, and then finally, we just had. Um, Another key part of my role in the project was creating a public engagement follow-up um, form, like a survey. And so where um, it was a framework, it's really easy to use. Researchers can tailor it to their own research as well. Um, and so it was really, really accessible, really easy. And again, we've had really great feedback on that from all the researchers that we've shown. And they've said, yeah, that, that, that looks great from our end. Um, so yes, yeah, so we were really pleased with it. Um, and as I said before, if there's, as everyone else has said, if there's any questions, please send them my way and I'm more than happy to, to answer. Thank you so much, Kate. It was excellent. And thank you also to Fiona and Sarah. Um, let me switch this back. Here we go. All right. So we're now ready to take questions for our panelists. There have been a few submitted so far. We'll give everyone else a chance to uh, send theirs in as well. Um, the first question uh, is actually for all of our panelists. Uh, we've been asked, what are some types of impact that humanities researchers uh, tend to demonstrate in your experience? So um, what would be useful evidence to try to collect as a humanities researcher is in the process of his or her, her research. Can I take this first? Sure. Well, um, uh, I think um, even within the humanities, there's quite a range of uh, different kinds of impact that I've seen. And um, I, I do hesitate to sort of pigeonhole certain types of impact to certain um, disciplines or fields. Um, but a lot of the strong, we in, in our last referentans, we saw impact, uh, we saw economic impact within our School of English, someone who'd worked with um, Blackpool, their specialism is in um, 
low, middle, uh, sort of working class entertainment um, in the Victorian and Edwardian era. So they worked closely with Blackpool to help them understand their own heritage and to bring that to the fore and to really boost um, the attraction of that and preserve it to increase um, tourist numbers. So it's basically development of cultural heritage, understanding of and development of cultural heritage. We have had academics who have shaped thought and debate. A lot of the humanities research is in areas that um, relate to fundamental questions that we ask ourselves as a society every day. You know, who are we? Where did we come from? How do we think about certain issues? How do we think about ourselves, our own journeys, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So there are lots of um, cases where. Uh, research in these various fields has related in to uh, those kinds of questions and fed into the debate and shaped thought around those areas. Um, and there's quite a strong strand as well of working with cultural organizations such as museums, galleries, um, publishing houses to help them understand and better target the archives they have, the resources they have, and to present um, to their service users, to their customers, to their visitors um, in a way that really shares the most um, recent cutting edge, up-to-date understanding and, and, and helps them uh, enhance their customer experience and in some cases actually uh, boost numbers. So those are just a few examples, but it can be really, really kind of broad. I don't know if it, I hope that answers your question. I think I would just agree with what Sarah said there. Um, I know that it's it's hard, sometimes harder, especially with altmetric data, doesn't necessarily always work for the humanities, um, and a lot of metrics are sort of more based to your sciences, but um, the sort of cultural, societal, and economic um, impacts that the humanities research has. Um, when Sarah was talking there, she reminded me of a project we have here at Sterling, it was the CREATES project, which was uh, research and development um, in arts organisations led by Claire Squires and had lots of impact, like Sarah was talking about, on museum numbers and um, how they understood their customers and who they were coming. So lots of information there that then be filtered up across creative and cultural industries in Scotland. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think I would um, add to that just briefly that there is a really great uh, cultural impact report that was published. Unfortunately, the name of the um, the agency within the UK is, is slipping my mind right now, but I'll find that and send that out. Uh, the report gives a lot of different uh, examples of ways that people have collected evidence for demonstrating impact um, and I think it could be it's pretty in-depth and it's definitely written more for uh, policy folks but I think your average researcher who's working in the humanities could also get a great deal out of it so I'll add that to the links that we send around after this webinar um, we've got a, another question here here about what evidence one uh, who might be a young researcher just starting out, how do you gather evidence of impact um, even if you're just really early in your career? And I think maybe the unasked part of that question is, uh, do you have recommendations for ways to communicate your research so that you might have downstream impact? And this is again a question for all panelists. I think, um, especially for the latter terms of um, the question there, it's about, um, to, to get further impact from it, it's about pushing those communications out. So we talk to our researchers about having active Twitter accounts, having active um, online social media presence, and putting your putting your um, your research out there to be taken, to be to be read, to be understood, to be engaged with um, with the wider wider public society, um, people that you might want to to be um, particularly engaging with it, and signposting it to them, so making it easy for them to find it, physically giving it to them um, through directed tweets or um, emails and different ways of allowing them to actually access and just opening up the, the realms of access. I think um, for the young researcher it is hard to to think what impact have they had and I remember doing my own PhD and thinking well what impact has it been to understand career management of creative and cultural uh, workers and there's so much impact that you have that you don't necessarily you don't necessarily know about so by then pushing it out in a communication form you're then also starting that the gathering journeys so I can then go on and find out when people have spoken about my research and um, 
and understood how they engaged with it and what their impact was. And I think just finding the sources of where it's been spoken about and by putting it out yourself to be spoken about helps a lot as well. Yeah, I would totally agree with what Fiona said and um, uh, about the importance of social media as a tool to get yourself spoken about. And um, uh, it can lead, I know that um, I spoke to a uh, uh, someone who's recently completed their PhD here um, at Sheffield in the social sciences and he um, did use social media actively um, and strategically and as a result of that he uh, got himself into conversations with a lot of his key stakeholders by actively following them and they in return followed him and he found that it opened up not only did it allow him to deliver impact um, but it also f opened up a lot of conversations with key stakeholders that actually really enriched his research, he thought. So it can have double benefits. And um, his recommendation to, to peers in the same situation would be to accept, you know, to, to not to be scared to engage in that um, just because you're starting out and to accept. Uh, he, he got an invitation to speak as a result of this to a group of stakeholders, and he did, and he said he, it was the most terrifying experience of his life. But again, he got lots of questions in that allowed him to really understand other perspectives, and um, he got a lot of contacts and networks that they then would um, use his research or follow his research, and it was a real virtuous circle for him. So I think getting out there and engaging uh, as much as you can, even more than you actually think you can, and pushing yourself is probably the best way to be able to do that. Excellent. So we have another question. How can impact administrators engage academics to regularly gather evidence of their own impacts? Um, I think that, if, sorry, I don't know if I cut you off, Sarah, sorry. I think for us that comes from being a part of the gathering yourself. So. Um, we're actively communicating the research that is going on here at Sterling using the optometric data to explain uh, the attention that uh, research is having and just through doing that ourselves we can push further encouragement um, to our researchers to also do the same and um, by picking up things where we see it and provide and helping them to, to source the evidence um, and just encouraging them to use our impact tool um, that we have on our research management system and just showing them that we're part of that journey with them I think really helps. Yes, I mean I find myself in a position usually where I'm responding to um, academics who want, who already want to um, be able to uh, demonstrate their own impact and just want some pointers as to how to evidence it. We are engaging in quite regular stock take exercises around the REF where people are asked to think about evidence so that has stimulated um, an interest in understanding how to do it properly and um, some of our departments as well, I mean the best way to do it is to build it into uh, SRDS chat um, annual reviews and to persuade different departments or faculties, we don't do it at a university level yet, but individual departments and some faculties are doing it, um, where you can talk about your impact as part of your performance review and for some faculties as well as part of the promotion criteria. So again, that is a, is a driver for people to gather evidence and the second strand of that is providing a tool which we do as well, similar to Sterling as part of our research management software, um, where they can easily store that kind of impact and order it and keep track of it. So that actually segues nicely into our next question. Uh, this is specifically for you, Sarah. Uh, what are some examples of the online tools that you mentioned that are available to researchers at Sheffield to store and track evidence? Is Altmetric one? Uh, do you have other recommendations? Um, we use Altmetric, yes, and we encourage our academics to do that. Um, we have Altmetric embedded in our uh, Symplectic we use, so um, Iris I think it's called, I cannot, I'm, um, it is part of the, it's called My Publications, so that is where we uh, store all information around grants, all information around professional activities and publications, and we now have the impact module to that, um, but that is because My Publications was the system we were using anyway, I know that Pure, I think it is, has one. I know that Vertigo Ventures um, have developed an impact tool. Those are the three key ones that I'm aware of, and I think Outmetrics works with all of those, if I'm not mistaken, but Stacey can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, so the one we provide for our um, staff 
purely because it fits with our existing management systems is the My Publications Impact Module, um, but Altmetrics is a part of that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, to answer your question, Sarah, we do integrate with all of the tools that you mentioned. Um, Vertigo Ventures, I'm not sure about, however, I know they're a relatively new player uh, in the game and I, I, don't, I don't believe that we uh, have a formal integration with them just yet. Um, so we've got a question um, from Alejandra in Peru. Uh, she is part of a team that is designing an internal social impact policy for research to strengthen her institution's relations with Peruvian society in general, uh, and also to show what their researchers are already doing. They're finding that their researchers are still hesitant about this approach. So her question is, what benefits have you seen that researchers in the UK have had with collecting evidence of their impact uh, and going through the evaluation process? Um, so maybe a add-on to that question might be uh, if you could give um, a brief explanation of how the REF funding process works and um, uh, talk maybe a little bit about, you know, uh, impacts for researchers beyond simply getting a, a slice of the uh, funding pie with the way that funding is distributed based on REF results in the UK. Um, okay, yes, good question actually. I forgot that not everyone knows about the REF because it looms so large in our um, lives. Uh, the Research Excellence Framework is a mechanism used in the United Kingdom every five or six years or so to um, rank the research active institutions as uh, based on the quality or, and excellence of their research. And that ranking depends or, or then informs how various chunks of funding are divided over the next five years. And the last time this happened back in 2014, for the first time, impact of research was introduced for the first time and made up 20% of the overall ranking. So normally before that it had been research outputs and publications and the quality of that. Um, whereas now we also had to demonstrate a certain amount of good impact case studies per number of full-time equivalent staff. And it, since it was a new um, measure and it was the first time we'd had to evidence impact, it was a massive learning curve for everybody involved. Um, and very interesting from many perspectives, but, but quite arduous. So that's the REF. Um, the benefits from staff beyond the REF um, can be really numerous. I mean, I, it, it's hard to identify the benefits of evidencing impact um, specifically and separately just to the ev benefits of uh, engaging in impact activities and, and generating impact. But in terms of evidencing, um, for us, it helps uh, certainly uh, in terms of uh, staff profile. We have lots of staff who've done um, public engagement it, on a high level or who have engaged with particular partners very successfully and fruitfully outside academia. And this engagement and um, the fact that it was reported and the fact that they could show the influence they've had um, has then led to other opportunities. It's led to them being the go-to expert in a certain field in terms of the media. They're always asked for comment on a particular subject and then it has led to maybe consultancy work, um, other external partners um, wanting to uh, part fund, um, research or go in jointly uh, for certain funding streams and um, it's just opened up a lot of possibilities for them professionally quite apart from the benefits to their research um, in terms of having access to the expertise, the data, the equipment sometimes of these partners if they do do collaborative research um, and of being able to use their platform to advocate in a whole range of ways for their field, for their discipline. Um, and for their own research. So I don't know if that answers the question exactly because it's more it's more about generating impact as a whole rather than just evidencing it. But you really need to evidence it and be able to show that in order to reap fully all of those benefits. I think I would fully echo everything that Sarah said and that was a lovely uh, explanation of the REF. It was very good and helpful to everyone hopefully. So I think on in addition to it, the, the evidencing and the benefits to that is is kind of just that looking back on and the reflection that you can have on the on your research, how it was done and how it was engaged with. 
um, you can it can have an influence then on your future research. So we know that researchers, as they talk to um, public people that would be interested in their research, they might find other ways that they wish to take their research forward or um, new avenues to explore. Um, and also through looking at the impact, finding the evidence that your impact is having, you can find new collaborators, be that academic collaborators, um, stakeholders, um, participants, other people that are engaging with your research and just um, it can have a lot of influence on your research going forward, which is a big benefit to it. Excellent. So with that, I would like to thank our panelists one final time. I think you all, um, it, great, great strategies were shared today for gathering evidence of impact and thinking strategically about doing so over time. It's, I think, is... Uh, both Fiona, Kate, and Sarah have made clear it's not a um, end-of-the-line prospect to gather evidence of impact. It really is an ongoing effort and one that you should be thinking about from the very beginning of your journey in terms of getting funded and including that data in your funding applications and so on. Uh, so, like I mentioned before, we'll be making um, the recording of this webinar today available via video. Uh, we'll send out that in a follow-up email in uh, 24 hours or so. We'll also share some links to some of the uh, resources that were discussed in today's webinar, as well as an infographic that Altmetric has created for some of the different types of data that you can collect, the metrics that you can collect um, to use, as Fiona pointed out, contextually, context is king, uh, to demonstrate relative impact of your research. So thanks all. Have a great day, everyone, and we hope to see you online soon.